Business Unusual, separating economic facts from fiction. Good evening, I'm Andy Hodges and welcome to ZFM Stereo's premier business show, Business Unusual, a show where we discuss everything to do with business, finance and economics. Now tonight we're privileged to welcome on our show a gentleman I think who goes without, uh, without introduction. His name is Mr. Tendai Beatty. He's one of the principals of the NBC Alliance. Uh, Tendai, welcome to Business Unusual. Right. Now, listeners, this is going to be a, a quite a, an interesting conversation. Um, and please feel free to get in touch with us with your questions on WhatsApp 073-116-8045 or our various social media platforms, Facebook and Twitter. We're also today uh, streaming live on Facebook on ZFM's Stereo's page. So please tune in on that. Uh, you can watch it live. Now, if I can ask you, listeners, today we're going to focus really on the economics and, um, and business perspectives of the MDC Alliance Manifesto that was issued this morning. So please, if we could do, con- constrain our questions to those sort of issues, because that's what it's about. It's not a political show. It's a show that really is discussing money and finance and business. So Tendai, now you're responsible for crafting or partly responsible for crafting the manifesto. In fact, you're quoted as saying that the next elections will be a war that will be contested on ideas. Uh, comments on that, sir. Yes, uh, I think for a long time, uh, Zimbabwean politics has certainly, certainly been uh, dominated uh, by things that should not be of concern uh, to ordinary average Zimbabweans. Ordinary average Zimbabweans want to know how they're going to pay uh, school fees, uh, how they're going to pay uh, rent, uh, how uh, the way and where they're going to get the next uh, meal. Uh, so in this election, we have decided to depersonalize the election. We've decided to move away from the politics of big men, uh, big syndromes, big egos, uh, to big ideas, to, to smart ideas. We have uh, decided deliberately as the MDC Alliance to put our people first and to push the agenda uh, of, of transformation, which is why the major theme running in our, in our smart document is, is transformation uh, opportunities and prosperity. Right, and I mean, that's what people want to hear. Right, I mean, your own manifesto, it says that it is a severe economic crisis that has been the most illustrative of Zimbabwe's leadership crisis. The economic crisis is the single most visible illustration of the government's gross failure and incompetence. The economy has been a rickety affair of severe boom and bust cycles characterized by chapters of severe unprecedented hyperinflation, a collapsed currency, and massive unemployment to the current status quo of low productivity, debt sustainability, and deflation and stagnation. Nation. That's in your own introduction. Now, one of your major um, uh, comments in the manifesto was the fact that the MDC Alliance is going to rationalize public service and elimination of ghost workers to reduce employment costs to 30% of total expenditure. Now, already reports are that government wages expenditure is about 80%. But I ask you this. I mean, when you reduce 50% of, of the civil servants, are you not now talking literally about job losses? No, no. The situation is this. Out of every dollar received by the government of Zimbabwe through revenue collection, 90% or 90 cents is actually going to the wage bill. And with the salary increases that were made uh, by Minister Chinamasa in the month of uh, April, that figure is actually now worse. It has been exacerbated. When I was Minister of Finance during the GNU, I used to pay 236,000 uh, public servants. Minister Chinamasa is paying 550,000 uh, public servants. Over 200,000 of those employees are in fact what we call ghost workers. These are government civil servants but who are, who are really in fact working for the ruling party in the villages. So we are basically saying that look, let's have genuine uh, civil servant. If you look in our manifesto, we actually say that the civil servant must be remunerated. We actually say that the civil servant must be given housing uh, uh, capacity to acquire a house through housing loans, mortgage finance. We actually say that there must be allowances for people deployed in the in the rural areas, but they must be genuine. So this business that we are paying for people that are in fact should be employed by the party through the state is not good enough. So, so in that regard. 
we are saying that ghost workers should go so that we reduce the percentage of total expenditure going to wage bill from 90% to 30% and from around 18 to 25 percent of gdp to the acceptable in the national standard of seven to eight percent of gdp right but i mean at the end of the day i mean with um with mr chamisa saying that he wants only 15 ministries and even though you say there are ghost workers there is going to be some reorganization in which some civil servants will have to lose their jobs that's correct is there a safety net the mdc alliance is putting in place to capture those workers in terms of retraining because obviously you can't just uh, even if it's five thousand ten thousand the, the, the ripple effect on their families is huge what is the mdc alliance proposing then for these workers who will be out of a job because there will be some obviously we have uh, thought about that very carefully. Uh, even if uh, we have called them ghost workers, at the end of the day, they're also uh, Zimbabweans. So you'll find that you'll find that uh, you'll find that uh, if you were to carry out an audit of the full capacity of our civil servants, you actually find that many of them were actually beneficiaries of the land reform program. So the land itself is a safety valve already and i would submit with great respect that uh, land and farming is actually a business uh if if i owned the farm i wouldn't be a, a, you know a, you know a civil servant because it's a big business which can gain, generate serious wealth a serious surplus so so if the challenge is around training and not understanding that farming is a business let's do that and you heard one of our major police proposals is that anyone who was a beneficiary of the land reform program ought to be given a title deed because one of the things that has killed our land econo- our, our economy is that we don't have a land market so therefore land is debt capital with use value only but not exchange value so if we give these civil servants retired civil servants with farms title deeds it means they can securitize those farms they can hypothecate those farms they can go to any bank and borrow money because banks will now have a security and therefore turn that into business so, okay. there's also there's also they also have skills many of these uh, 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 servants in, in many vocational areas like carpentry uh, woodwork and so forth so the economy ought to be uh, you know absorb them and remember our key mantra is that we want to expand the cake by building a hundred billion dollar economy so therefore any everyone should be able to come to the party and have a share of zimbabwe because okay. our mantra is to create a shared inclusive economy that carries everyone on board okay yes sir but i mean but at the end of the day though i mean you know you you imply that everybody in the silver servant is able to work on a farm or to have these skills and so forth there is going to be a net and you talk about banks being giving them finance which actually is not really happening on the ground even today for farms farmers that have some form of a lease agreement so i mean you know there is a cost to this of course the, the economy is huge and the economy is huge i've just spoken of agriculture I haven't spoken of uh, and, 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 and skills. I haven't spoken of uh, in entrepreneurship, the capacity of any one of those individuals of actually starting a business. I haven't spoken of uh, the low hanging fruit of, of, of tourism. One of the one of the things that is most understated in Zimbabwe is cultural, uh, uh, you know, tourism. Can you imagine? the kind of tourism that would arise if uh, we would have villages where tor- tourists from outside Zimbabwe would just come and see how life in a village is, staying in a hut, uh, uh, you know, means. Uh, I haven't spoken about uh, the services industry. I spoke this morning about uh, consumer-facing industries and how they have become drivers of modern uh, economies because they generate domestic uh, uh, demand through uh, consumption. So, so in my, in my view, they might be uh, you, know, if, uh, you know, limitation on understanding that we can actually be creative because of our education system. When I went to school, I was taught how to apply for a job. They used to call it a vacancy, mm. uh, my grade 7 mm. teachers. Uh, but uh, my own children are being taught how to prepare business proposals. Right. Uh, and so that paradigm is very key. You just don't have to sell labor alone. You can actually also buy labor through business and okay. capital. <clears throat> All right, thank you. I mean, we'll take a, a, a question here <clears throat> from a listener. I really doubt the statistics that is giving about ghost workers. So how did you come up with the money they consume? This is conjecture, not facts. Uh, this is a subject I know very well. Uh, I, was, I was in government, so I, I, know, I know these figures and these statistics very intimately. Remember uh, and that in 2010, 
we actually had a public service audit mm. which was done by a kpmg from india so these figures are validated these figures are confirmed okay perfect now <clears throat> one of your manifesto talks about security services transformation um and talking about uh, transform and maintain the Zimbabwe national army i will say however that the manifesto does regard security services as key to maintaining peace and a major underlying assumption of our development program that's in your own manifesto absolutely but but at the same time by that reorganization does that also mean a leaner meaner armed forces does it mean that the security services also will be looking at some form of reduction under the MDC Alliance manifesto? Those are operational issues okay. which we as an alliance are not qualified to uh, to talk about that. Okay. But what we are qualified to talk about is that the National Army and all the security forces covered in Chapter 11 of our Constitution are providing a national service, an important uh, national service. Therefore, this should be remunerated well. I think you heard President Chamisa saying at the launch today that why, why do we uh, reduce a soldier to look for a commuter owned bus and jump at the back of a lorry when he's providing a, you know you know a service so the provision of security service in our country is key and because it is key it must be accompanied and married with dignity okay. dignity means that there must be decent housing for the military there must be decent food provisions for the military there must be decent uh, wages and remuneration uh, for the military but of course the military also have got a duty to respect the constitution to keep away from politics to respect the parliament and, and and so that's the equation that's the new contract we are seeking for okay. we have to look All after right. our people well one thing on your manifesto which which struck me was about the cio <coughs> central intelligence organization you said you wanted to expand the scope of the intelligence services to assist in economic and financial crimes, including money laundering and illicit flows. Are you saying that there isn't the capacity at the moment in the organizations that are in place to do that? I mean, why would you want the CIO, if I can call them, in other areas you'd call them the secret police, to be involved in such areas? I mean, is that, is that not also intrusive in its own way? Yeah. Firstly, the, the most important point we make about the, our intelligence is that they must cease to be invisible. So, if you look, we've got four, the security sectors have got four arms. So you've got uh, the, the military, which is covered by the Zimbabwe De Defense uh, Act. You have got uh, the police, which is covered by the Police Act. You have got the prisons and correctional services, which is covered by the Prisons Act. But there is no law that governs uh, intelligence. So the first thing we make in our manifesto is that these ladies and uh, comrades and friends who are operating in the intelligence should cease to be invisible they should be governed by an act of parliament so th so that parliament can can preside over them they shouldn't be invisible being a cio in zimbabwe carries a certain stigma uh, and and so we want to destigmatize that stigma associated with our intelligence so that they're open and the person can actually say guys i work for the intelligence and there's nothing to be ashamed of. yeah but you but think come, but yeah. coming to your spe specific right. question now what we are basically saying is that the culture of intelligence in zimbabwe has been wrong and faulty because the culture of intelligence in zimbabwe has been the state using the intelligence to deal with its political opponents, in particular the opposition. And we are therefore saying that the opposition is not an enemy. What is an enemy are those who harm and damage the Zimbabwe as a state, including economic uh, uh, saboteurs. So any intelligence department surely should have the capacity to carry out economic surveillance and economic intelligence. Who is smuggling goods? Where and from what? I can tell you something. Illicit financial flows. Between 2009 and 2012, this country lost 3 billion US dollars in illicit financial flows. Between 2006, uh, 2006 when diamonds were discovered, to 2013, this country lost 15 billion US dollars worth of diamond money but not a single person has been prosecuted. So we are saying these are the kind of things that the intelligence should be looking at but these are the kind of things that really make a difference not following a member of the opposition and seeing which house is she going tonight or or or, or <laughs> okay. which church is All right, but yeah okay I, I just thought that you know in a way I mean you, you talk about the CIO being being open and being transparent but at the same we time, want them to be open and transparent yeah, but be, be being involved in those sort of uh, yes. white collar crimes yes. does get you really yes. it does because, it's not because, that's because, more in the face of, the of ordinary people the police don't have the 
the capacity, the specialized capacity for this kind of things. Okay. Yes. All right. Now let's talk about the cash crisis and and, yes. and your and your uh, your manifesto and what it says about currency in the market. Now, one thing that I must be honest, I, I, I when I read this, I was a little bit disappointed. It says it is our hope and prayer that any of the regional econo- economic communities, SADEC, Comesa, EAC, Rex, etc., will in the near future establish a functional monetary union. The MDC allowance government will join such a monetary union and adopt its current as a legal tender for Zimbabwe. Now, I must be honest, there's been a little bit of confusion. On the one side, I, I, the MDC alliance or principles in it were calling for adoption of the South African Rand as our currency. Um, in your manifesto, you talk about strengthening the regime of multiple currencies in the short term. And then this, 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 this comment about it is our hope and prayer. And I, as you know, we don't believe in hope and prayer. So maybe you could explain yeah, that. No, no, it's, 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 we are very clear. This is one area that is affecting Zimbabweans. Our manifesto is clear and we are very clear. So our position on the cash crisis is as follows. Our position on the current issue is as follows. Number one, we are going to demonetize the, the bond note. Immediately after President Chamis has been sworn in, we are going to scrap the bond note. So the next question is, what then? The answer is very simple in the short term. Well, before you carry yeah. on, Tendai, the yes. fact is this, the bond note, though, in terms of cash and circulation is very minor. I mean, it's what, almost, what, only $400 million in the cash yeah, market, the so psycholo- scrapping it. Yeah, the psychology of the bond note. Remember, and, and you know this, mm. Yeah, finance and economics is largely about confidence. When you have high inflation, it's economic mismanagement. When you have hyperinflation, it's not economics anymore. It's about confidence. What has happened in our country is the broken down of the social contract. That's why in our introduction, we mentioned about rediscovering the social contract, putting trust in our, our, our country. So the bond note is an instrument of arbitrage. People associated with the, with the Zim dollar and the beira checks that we discarded uh, uh, de facto and de jure as the public in 2008, in 2007. So the scrapping of the bond notes is little to do with the, the bond notes that is a percentage of the broad money supply M3. It has got everything to do with confidence because it has been an instrument in the minds of our people, an instrument of arbitrage. Okay. So number two, we then strengthen the regime of multiple currencies. Every Zimbabwean understands a, a US dollar, a rand. They are there are the reserve bank estimates that right now the reserve bank estimates that there's two billion US dollars that is unbanked because no one, including you, Andy, mm-hmm. will take your money, your US dollars. Now I'm told the premium on the black market is now seventy no, percent. Yeah, it's, it's so, skyrocketing. Yeah, so no one will take his US dollar or a US dollar to go into a bank where you know you won't get it out, or if you get it out, you can only get it as what air in the form of either a, a bond note or RTGS. So people are sitting on money. So once you say, as we will do, that guys from today, from today, we want the banks to open two accounts, a US dollar account and a local dollar account, which is basically the RTGS note, you will see us a, a, a recapitalizing the stock of US dollars in, the, in this economy. Yeah, but I mean, look, so so, so yeah. that is doable and, and is the country actually has no choice. There's no other, there's no other formula because remember, Andy, we do not have sufficient reserves mm. to bring our own currency. So you want a stop get measure. The stop get measure is the multiple currency regime. And you know, Andy, that uh, the, the, the multiple currency regimes were working. When I, when I left as Minister of Finance, I left a total uh, stock of US 6.5 billion US dollars sitting in, the, in, the, in, 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 in RTGS balances, sitting in, in Nostro accounts. What happened, you know, if an overzealous, uh, 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 expansive fiscal policy uh, 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 you know, you know, killed our that entire stock. So that's why we start. If you look at our document, we say let's have fiscal consolidation, let's have macroeconomic stability, let's eat what we uh, kill, let's pursue a primary balance. Because we are saying let's address the cause of the cash shortage. It's, it's government and it's uh, insatiable appetite for consumption uh, without 
production. I mean, yeah, but I mean, here you're talking now about government expenditure, for example. Yeah, but because, I mean, because it's connected, Andy, right? With our case shootings. Yeah, but the fact is this, though. I mean, you you can say that we live we live within our means, but I mean, your manifesto is very clear. I mean, all through the manifesto, it talks about um, uh, b- b- throwing money at certain parts. You talk about health. You talk about so forth. You talk about giving yeah. adequate resources and it, so on. So, it, it, in a way, though, the, this manifesto implies that there's going to be a lot of borrowing that it, it, needs to be done. It, is this correct? And mm. look at our macroeconomic framework. Look at the macroeconomic framework that establishes the hundred billion dollar economy. Look, look at that. Because we've got a budget there. We've got our budget there. That document is very scientific. We put a lot of effort in it with expert help. I'm, I'm just a poor lawyer, but we we had proper expert help from within and outside our country. But you have to make you yeah. have to make so, some assumptions so, about so how to if, balance that. Correct. Yeah. So if you look at that. When you look at that macroeconomic framework, you see the levels of the revenue, you see the levels of the expenditure. We are not going to commit the cardinal sin of running a, a, a budget deficit because it has got a multiplier effect uh, in the economy. Okay. You are a banker. You know the crowding effect, the crowding mm-hmm. out effect of a heavy government that dries out all resources from the financial markets as is the present case in in in, in, in pot, pot point in time one of the things which we propose which is so key if you read our section on the reform of the central bank mm. is that we're going to amend the central bank so that the government treasury is never allowed to maintain a, a, a an overdraft with the central bank so we said government shouldn't borrow from the central bank I mean, I so that you. we so that we instill a discipline and and you know you are a banker you know the consequences of a right. of an undisciplined over zealous okay but but uh, tendai, uh, yeah, tendai thank you for that but i mean at the end of the day though you know a lot of people are just trying to get their salaries out of banks you know they they haven't got large balance in banks they're curious in banks they're just trying to get cash to do their everyday needs nothing you've said seems to imply that that is going to change it will change one of the things we mentioned there is liberalizing the capital account. It's there. I, I did it in 2009. When I became finance minister, there was a mere stock of US $250 million in the entire financial service sector. And that included the entire balance sheet. In other words, mm-hmm. including the buildings. By the end of the year, we had US $1.8 billion. US dollars. We got to that level because I liberalized the capital account. I said, if you want to bring in money, just bring it... M- and if you want to take it out, you can take it out. That's important. That's trust. That's restoration of the of the of the of the social contract, which is missing. When people know that no one is going to touch you, you're going to be free. People react. After all, economics is a study of human behavior, not economic behavior, mm. of human behavior. So these things we've done them before, they've been done in other countries. We have to restore confidence in our country because that is what is missing. I have been uh, observing the informal sector for a long time. If you go to Mbare Magaba, you'll be shocked by the hard currency that is changing hands end. Mm. But that money is not banked because no one trusts the banking system. Let's get people trusting the banking system again and you'll be shocked by how in a very short period of time we are able to recapitalize and get banking stock of, of five billion dollars, get broad money supply of 15, 18 billion dollars. Okay, thank you for that. Now, um, please, listeners, if you want to get involved in the conversation, please WhatsApp us on 073-116-8045 or various social media platforms. And of course, we're, we're uh, shooting live on Facebook. So please, uh, please join us on ZFM's Facebook page. Now, um, we have another question. Um, good evening. My name is Mike. How does Mr. BT intend to acquire the funding for capital expenditure um, and GOP? Sorry, we seem to be having apologies. Uh, and G- GDP growth focused funding. Excellent. How can he claim to want to provide security of tenor? Well, only a few months ago, he went to the USA. Um, well, sorry, we're getting calls. It's, it's blowing up, by the way, uh, yeah. Tendai. Uh, how, does, how can he claim he, he wants to provide security of tenure when only a few months ago he went to the USA to beg to keep access to funding from IFIs under American influence to maintain their current stance? Thank you. Yes, uh, the first part of the question was, 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 was brilliant. The financing of our reconstruction uh, program, uh, which, is, which is Chapter 6 of our manifesto and uh, Pillar 5 uh, of our... Uh, canon five of our of our of our agenda of our smart agenda so funding this is how we propose to fund our programs so firstly the budget is going to be key and contrary to to 
many people don't actually know that we collect more than 300 million US dollars every month. That's a lot of money, Andy. Mm. That's a lot of money. So the problem is not the money being collected, it's how it is being spent. Utilization of the yeah, money. Yeah, which is why on our, on our section on fiscal consolidation, we've said we want to alter and revisit the expenditure mix of the government so that it is tilted towards the capital Cons, you know, is opposed to uh, consumption. Right. Number two, number two, and this is very key. We have to resolve the debt crisis. You heard me at the launch talk about SADSA, our smart uh, areas debt and development strategy. That is very key, SADSA, because resolving the debt crisis means that we have made peace with the World Bank. We've made peace with the IMF. We've made peace with the African Development Bank. We've made peace with the Paris Club of Lenders. We are therefore able to attract concessionary grants from the World Bank. Remember, the original name of the World Bank is actually the International Bank of Reconstruction. So, so we are able to, so we are able to attract capital for 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 our roads for our energy and so forth right. number three is foreign direct investment okay sorry Tenda, foreign I, have to, portfolio sorry, I have to investment. cut you off there because we have to take a break uh, but please join us after the break we're going to continue this discussion about how to bring in and to get and to bridge that gdp gap uh, please join us after the break we have Tendai bt one of the principals of mdc alliance Welcome back to Business Unusual. Um, we have with us in the studio Mr. Tendai Beatty. He's one of the main principals of the MDC Alliance. Um, and we're talking about the economic and business uh, impact of the, of the MDC Manifesto, Alliance Manifesto, which was issued this morning. So I'm sorry we cut you off. You were talking about how to fund the gap between GDP and, and your plans that you, were, that you have in the, in the Alliance Manifesto. Yes, yes, yeah. So... Yeah, how, 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 how to actually fund our right. reconstruction agenda? Yes, dams, uh, bridges, electricity, roads, uh, railway. So I'd say the first source of funding surely must be our own on our own revenues. I was as government minister able to do a lot of things just on on our revenues. I completed Tokyo Mkosi. I completed the airport, the Joshua and Gomo Airport in Bulawayo just on our re- 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 revenues. Started the dualization of the Arare Marondera Road. So with the correct mix of revenue and expenditure we can do that then i spoke about uh, resolving the debt question as a passport to accessing the huge levels of development of finance that are in in the national financial institutions i can tell you that within the next five years alone the world bank has got over 75 billion dollars reserved for african infrastructure the african development bank over the same period has got us 30 billion dollars but we as zimbabweans can't access that money because we have over borrowed and we've resolved our debt question okay the third thing the third thing very quickly andy is private sector participation through triple p's uh, public private sector partnerships in the form of BOTs mm. built on and transfer in the form of BOTs built on operate and transfer that's a model that works everywhere in the world you give a concession of 15 years 20 years on a road to a private sector they get tolling money and 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 you move uh, you move forward uh, the, the, so so the, the last thing is private uh, sector funding, venture capital, private equity funds, and so forth. Okay, and but then that obviously implies that you you would have to change the quantum thought about the Zimbabwe and the economy in terms of confidence, in terms of international lenders. That's coming what in. our document seeks right. to do. Now, now there is a question. I mean. Your manifesto is very, very clear on promises. You talk about um, building new railway lines, building a new metro tube in certain sectors of the economy. You talk about uh, 300 million to modernizing the electric grid. You talk about the country that's moving that's to transmission, yeah. transmission, moving to green energy. Yes. Um, and also you talk about your energy program, Wange, Rehab, Atoka, Gorge, and so forth. I mean, what is the difference between your manifesto and Zanu PF's manifesto? Oh, there's a huge difference. Mm. Our manifesto is a manifesto of ideas. Uh, that, that's why we're discussing it. It's, it's, it's disruptive. It's, it's original. It's full of ideas and, and ideas that are, that, are, that are doable. It's a smart manifesto and a manifesto for, for the future. These things are doable. And remember, Andy, we have been in government before. So we are tried and tested. We're not green ones. So we transformed this economy. When I became finance minister, inflation, Andy, was 500 billion percent. We turned around that in a matter of months. This economy in, in 2011 grew by 12 percent, which was the highest, not in Africa, but in the world. So, so we are talking about things that we know we can do because we've done yeah, that but before. Do, but do you expect these things like uh, modernizing railways and so on and so forth? I Absolutely. mean, these are, these are not happening overnight, though. What, what is your time span in terms of... Because your manifesto is very... Not 
not clear on time, no, 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 really, it, is it? It, it, it is. just talks about ten years it or in it, within a decade. If you go to the, if you go to the infrastructure section, it says that, and and we're talking, we're we're, we're quoting a source, not ourselves, the African Development Bank, not ourselves, the African B- Development Bank, which is Africa's primary development bank, estimates that if you put four fourteen point nine eight billion US dollars in this economy in the next five years you can transform this transform the economy and and so this is doable this is done this is done in fact that section on infrastructure we 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 compared and notes a lot with the african development bank and the world bank so things like uh, let me just give you an example one of the things we want to establish is is electricity generation output of, of about four thousand uh, megawatts it costs it, it takes about three to four years to construct a, a power station. So we are targeting the following a, a, a power a, a, a matrices. Number one, expansion of Wange, seven and eight. That will generate about a thousand uh, uh, you know, megawatts. We are uh, uh, targeting Batoka Gorge, which will generate about 2,000 megawatts. But because Batoka Gorge is shared, is on the Zambezi Zambia. Valley, shared between Zambia and Zimbabwe, will share a thousand uh, with them in the thousand to Zambia. Now that's that's two thousand megawatts already. It will transform our country. Zimplas right now can't put a refinery in Zimbabwe because they don't have a mere seventy-five megawatts to start that. So with an additional two thousand megawatts, we can kickstart uh, this economy. Okay. Take 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 another one of our flagship pro, uh, uh, agendas. Uh, Arare to Churundu, Arare the Arare to Churundu uh, highway, which we. Define is one of our flagships. Uh, and that road it costs about a million, so it costs about a million dollars to do one kilometer of uh, paved uh, uh, road. So from Arare to Masingo, about five hundred million uh, dollars. Right. For, but okay. But do, do you honestly believe that we 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 feel that the MDC Alliance is going to bring in metros and tube stations into places like Chitkuza? I mean, is is that is that? A, I mean, and, it's and, obviously in and, your manifesto, so and, you must be serious. And, how do you, how and, is that? And, and when we live in closed societies. We begin to think the abnormal is normal. Ethiopia right now is just commissioned in Addis Ababa. A metro station. This is an African country. A metro station with 39 stops. But I'll tell you something about Ethiopia. In 19... So in 1990... Remember in 1989, that's when Bob Geldof came to Zimbabwe for AIDS. Right. The brain aid to support Ethiopia. So in 1990, a year after their major famine, Ethiopia's GDP was a mere three billion dollars. Right now, Ethiopia's GDP is 61 billion dollars. So, so Zimbabweans should understand that we we have been taught to believe that mediocrity, broken roads, broken power stations, electricity that doesn't work is the normal. It is not the normal. Okay. Morocco right now, as I'm talking to you, is commissioning a bullet train, and that's an African country. Yeah, but the- Ke- Kenya, Kenya, as I'm talking to you, is going to commission air taxis. It has been chosen by one big American company to commission air taxis. So the sky is limit. We should dream. You are exposed. Mm. You travel all over Africa. South Africa, look at South African you know, infrastructure. The spaghetti roads, which we are talking about, are they in South Africa? And so, if they can did it too, why can't we did it too? No, uh, you, you can say that, but this all comes at a cost, correct? I mean, this all comes at a financial cost, and you're talking about it's now private... Our, it's not talking, our money. You're talking about private partnerships. It's not our money. Investors. It's not our money. Ain't. Okay. The, the, the international finance frontiers are looking for a frontier of investment. And Zimbabwe is one of the last real emerging uh, markets, just like the rest of Africa. A few years ago, Zambia wanted $700 million. It issued a bond. It was oversubscribed 11 times. They got $11 billion. Rwanda, a few years ago, wanted for, uh, for just a mere $400 million. There's $7 billion. So there's money out there, but that money wants to go into a safe environment. That man wants to go into a credible environment. That man wants to go into an environment it can it can trust. This has not been possible to date. Okay. But under, right. And after 1st of August, you know that it is possible. All right, so let's take a question. Uh, giving freedom to the capital account is the only solution to cash crisis. Mr. Beatty, you are talking sense. But my question is, how are you going to pay the debt? 
again. It's again. I think I think this is the, this is the, obviously the, the underlying thought is that is that sure you can do budgets, you can do projections, you can do uh, what I can call forecasts. Correct. At the end of the day, it does come down to dollars and cents. Yeah, but but you see, the capital account is not a government account. The capital account records all the capital inflows in a in a country. So when we're saying we're liberalizing the capital account, we're saying anyone who wants to bring in money in Zimbabwe, bring money. That money is not going into the government. That money is going, private investors going to the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange. That money is going to uh, uh, private investors buying a, 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 a mine there, but, uh, doing the triple piece that we were talking about, buying decayed companies. That increases the stock of money. Right. But, yes. but however, though, I mean, on the other side, that means that you still have to, you still have to, at some point, there has to be money going into the system, which means you have to uh, boost exports. You've got to look at boosting the export Correct. market and so but, forth. Because but, the question but, but that I've been... You, but you, you boost exports, Andy. Exports don't come from the government. The government doesn't produce anything. You boost exports because your companies are producing and the companies are selling outside. These companies are exporting outside. Right. So one of the things we say there, and Vama Shakada this afternoon uh, 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 this, uh, uh, presented on our, on our trade policy. We intend to pursue export-led growth by doing a number of things. Number one, joining the Rand Monetary Union, for instance. We should join the but Rand wait, Monetary sorry, Union. Before you continue, Tendai, would you like to be under the control of the Reserve Bank of South Africa? Is that, is that what it's, Because that's what the Rand Monetary Union is going to do, is it not correct? You know, Put you us know, into the know, Rand Monetary Area. Andy, Andy, I mean, it's a question. Andy, is that, is that Andy, a fact? Andy, Andy, there's no such thing as economic nationalism. There's no such thing. The dollar is international. Capital is international. The capital account is international. The current account is international. So when we sell our goods to China, we're not thinking of sovereignty. We're thinking of business. So don't constrain us by, by the language of, of nationalism. So you're happy to, to give the South African one monetary area, which is controlled by the Saab, South African it's Reserve Bank, control over the f- fiscal policy of the Zimbabwe? No, no, monetary policy. Monetary policy. Yeah. You're happy, you're happy that it's a, it's a, to advocate it's a, for that? The, all the members... All for that union have membership in the South African Reserve Bank. So, okay. so take, take, take the right, European okay. Union. Take the European Union, end. Mm. The European Union runs a monetary union in respect of which the euro is the currency. But you and I know that the euro, the euro is providing tremendous benefit to the countries in that commission. But you and I know that the euro is at the Dutch mark by another name. But you don't hear a France saying, ah, oh, no, we're giving control to the Germans. But that's not the case. Don't impose nationalism okay. on something that is not nationalistic. The dollar right. is not nationalistic. You All can't right. keep it let's, in your boundary. So let's, take, let's take your question. So please keep, keep your, your questions are pouring in. And I'm sorry, uh, this, I think an hour is not enough, I think, to be honest. We, have, we should have you have this for a much longer show. But please feel free to WhatsApp your questions on 073-116-8045. And of course, we're streaming live on our Facebook page, ZFM Stereo. Now, take a question. Good evening. During his tenure as finance minister between 2009 and 2013, growth is on a downward trend after 2011. Economists have stated thus, meaning Mr. BT has no track record when it comes to issues financial. I would love to hear what he has to say about that. You know, interesting you know, question. It's not an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you see e- economics don't lie. You know, economics don't lie. In, in 2009, our growth rate was about 5.6%. So, actually, actually 10, 10, 10.1%. In 2010, our growth rate was 11.9 percent rounded off to 12 percent in 2012 our growth rate was seven percent in 2013 our growth rate was five percent so these are growth rates in real terms that speak for itself that is why the rest africa recognized what we did the government of national unity during my tenure was recognized as having the best finance ministry in Africa, chosen by other African ministers. Mm-hmm. So economics don't lie. He, the person who asked that question, will remember that we had hyperinflation of 500 billion percent. Prices used to change when you are in a queue to go and pay it a till. So we stabilize this economy, and Zimbabweans know that they can trust us. Okay, let's take another question. Uh, thank you, you've answered my question, but I have a question again. Your manifesto doesn't pull out the taxation side. How are you going to do, what, how are you going to do on the issue of highly taxed individuals and labor? Oh, no, no. Uh, we, it, it does, it does. I actually spoke about it. Number one, number one, we want to uh, 
increase for for workers our poor workers who pay 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 as un we want to increase the band of non-taxable income so we, we intend to do that so if we if you earn 400 dollars we want as much money as possible to get into your into your pocket and we are in a recession already we're in a recession already the only way you can get out of a recession is when people have disposable incomes and they can spend their way out of the out of the uh, recession number two we are proposing something very revolutionary andy we are proposing a, 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 for corporate taxes we are proposing a flat tax rate of 15 percent georgia has done that estonia has done that this is revolutionary and number three and very radical you know that in terms of section 14 of our income tax act the method of calculation of tax in zimbabwe is residence based but we are losing a lot of revenues because many companies change their residence from Harare to London, Harare to Mauritius, Harare to South Africa, Harare to the Seychelles. So we are saying we are changing the method of calculating tax from resident to source. By that we mean anything sourced from Zimbabwe, anything produced from Zimbabwe will be taxed. Number four, we want to make our tax progressive. VAT or sales tax is very unprogressive because you pay 15% VAT whether you're a multi-billionaire or you 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 are like my aunt you come from dotito so we want to move away from uh, from uh, from this uh, direct taxes that are not progressive to a level of uh, progressive tax. Okay. So we're very clear on the tax. Uh, okay. Let's take a take a question here. Zimbabwe needs people with a vision. We are not obsessed with results over five years, but sustainable long-term plans. Bullet chains do not necessarily have to be delivered this parliament. It's a hunter-gatherer's mentality. And this is why we have always lived hand-to-mouth, patching up old roads instead of constructing new ones. Excellent. MDC Alliance are absolutely right. Infrastructure projects are our gateway. People will get employed and government will recover a lot of money via taxes and from earned revenue. But, you know, the assumption that you're making is reduction of taxes, reduction of, of, of ease of doing business costs, if I can call it that way, has to be balanced by increased investment, has to be balanced by increased exports. That's has the to be whole idea. Yet, however, we do have That's a situation where infrastructure, for example, in this country is dilapidated. Yes. And I know there was a huge part of your manifesto that talked about that chapter, infrastructure. Chapter right. And so, therefore, there's a, a lot of money has to go into infrastructure development. You talk about giving, um, giving stimulus packages for distressed companies operating in Zimbabwe, provision of long-term financing through sector-specific stimulus schemes. The question remains is how are you going to pay for this? And as I keep on saying, mm. a smart government, a smart government hardly finances infrastructure, for instance, because you don't have the resources anyway. Right. The private sector does that for you through triple P's. Development finance does that for you. And development finance right now Right now, just doesn't this to come from the World Bank, from the African Development Bank? We've got the Asia Development Bank, we've got the Chinese Import and Export Bank, we've got uh, the DBSA in South Africa. When we resurfaced and modernized Plum Tree to Bait Bridge, we borrowed money through Intrafink, not as government, from DBSA about around 260 million dollars. So, smart economics doesn't. And I don't know why, why, why there's this fixation that money is coming from treasury. Treasury is going to pay salaries, hospitals, and so forth. But your capital expenditure, no smart government does that. The private sector does it for you. Development finance uh, does it for you. And, and we are smart people. We, we have just run the smart document. We're okay. going to do that. All right. Now, um, you, you talked about uh, in your manifesto, focus on and leverage the liberty on 17 value change identified by the CZI. Yes. Now, this is an interesting one because I, I'm, I am a big proponent of value change, yes. change and how we can maximize that. Uh, maybe you could talk us through the MDC Alliance's uh, thoughts on this value chain claims and CZI and, and what, what, what does that mean to business in this country? Well, there's a, there's a, there's a page that we actually that we actually uh, outline uh, yeah i mean you say for example maize to mealy meal yes, value chain exactly. wheat to bread exactly. barley so forth exactly. horticulture production exactly. but i mean this requires so, some form so, of serious ma- management of the industrial complex in terms of how do you the get pri- the supply chain to sector, work together the private sector can do that the private sector can can do that because the private sector wants to maximize return and 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 and, and, and people in the private sector know that you can only ma- maximize return by v- beneficiation by value chains so the private sector simply need to be given the space 
uh, to do that. Yeah, but, but and, and that's what we're going to yeah, do. Chendai, look, I mean, people have said to me, we, you know, over over the last couple of weeks that we're a nation of importers. We seem to want to consume imports, and we're not actually manufacturing ourselves in terms of what we used to manufacture. Yeah, yeah, if you look because, back at 15, because, 20 years ago, yes, so yes, surely yes, you, yes. your 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 party must put in place uh, mechanisms in in terms of us becoming a net exporter. Our goods and our goods and services must have quality. Yeah, they must so, be price sensitive to exactly, importers. So exactly. how how are you looking yes. at doing that? Let, you have made a valid point that our current account is dilapidated. Now it's around 18% of GDP. In other words, we have now largely become a huge supermarket of, of South Africa, of China, of the United Kingdom. How do we reverse this and press, press the restart button? Why are companies moving out? Why are we exporting labor? We're exporting labor because, number one, we are not competitive. If you t- just take electricity, the cost of electricity in Zimbabwe for an industrialist is around 11.3 cents per kilowatt. The same electricity costs 6 cents, an average of 6 cents per kilowatt in the region. So naturally, a producer will move from Zimbabwe. What about, what about the taxes? We've got multiple taxes in the country which are not sustainable. Rates from local authorities, this one wants that. All this makes Zimbabwe uncompetitive. So we have to address the hardware of the economy and that's what we seek to do in our in our pledge okay. uh, uh, you know you know document let's, let's take so, a, so uh, address the ease of doing uh, uh, you know you know business and cut down the Addre- costs of doing business uh, cut down the cost of doing business address okay. enablers make roads safe and accessible introduce railway lines so that those who ferry goods like coal from wangi they don't have to use dilapidated wagons that will not be uh, uh, strangers at all in the in the train that Cecil John Rhodes used in 1890. So, 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 I mean, so your manifesto is really based on the premise that the MDC Alliance would have a better grasp of economic fundamentals and how to manage the economy? Is, is this what you're and, saying and, in essence? You have read that document. It speaks for itself. This document speaks for itself. It's a well thought out document. It's a disruptive document. It's an original document. It's a practical document. And it put our people first. Okay. Um, Mr. Beatty, the economic fundamentals ripe for a Zim currency, which is a prerequisite to enter the RAND Union. This is a question. Yes. Firstly, we don't have the conditions that are requisite for the return of any currency. A currency is a relationship between your exports and your imports. Money, mm. your currency is a relationship between your export and imports. So if you are like Zimbabwe right now, where the ratio uh, of your of your of your imports to exports uh, is is one is to sort of four is to one. In other mm. words, for every dollar that comes in in the form of export income, four dollars are going out as imports. You've got a problem. So if you introduce a currency under those circumstances. The, the cost of uh, imports will just collapse it and we are back again to the Zimbabwean dollar. That's why we say it as a temporary stopgap measure, we have to operate on the basis of uh, multiple currencies and then we have to converge our figures, our, our fiscal figures, we have to convert them with those of South Africa, those of Namibia, those of Botswana, those of uh, uh, Lesotho, those of Swaziland, so that we don't export into the Rand Monetary Union our problems. Right. But once we join the Rand Monetary Union and we qualify, we actually have to bring our own currency. Just like Namibia has got its own currency, just like right. Switzerland exactly. has got its own currency. So we'll have to but do that if currency, we join the Rand Monetary yes, Union. But this currency now will be pegged one for one uh, with the with the Rand. Okay. That's the advantage. So, right. so the Rand Monetary Union allows you to, end, to have your cake and eat it. You have your own currency but pegged to a stable, convertible currency, right. which is the rand. Okay, well, a little bit of levity, because we have a we have a comment from a listener, and it says, can we please have Andy Hodges as our next finance minister? <laughs> well, thank you very much. You. Anyway, let's go on to this, because the one thing that you, I, I must say, is sacrosanct appears to be in your manifesto, is you call the building of a hundred billion economy, you call it your holy grail, because it underpins this entire manifesto, Absolutely. the way I read this. Absolutely. And and I just want to focus on a couple of issues. Um, you, you, know, you, you touched on macroeconomic stability and fiscal di- discipline, financial sector reform, currency reform. Let's talk about that. Now, you, you talked at length in your manifesto about the central bank and how yes. you wanted to possibly, if I read it correctly, move the central bank out of the control the Ministry of Finance and make it a standalone entity. Is, is this correct? Yeah, we, we propose three things about the Central Bank. Number one, we propose to make it independent. The Central Bank must be independent. In other words, we want to remove the section, section 6 of the Reserve Bank Act, 
which says it takes in section 8 as well which says the central bank takes directives from the minister of finance number two the reserve bank can be both in a, a referee and a player so, so you know as a banker that the reserve bank is a regulator but it also issues licenses so we want to to deal with the regulatory infrastructure in zimbabwe by forming and creating what we are calling zifasi zimbabwe financial zifari zimbabwe financial regulatory authority this is zifari this financial regulatory authority would regulate banks and would regulate the money market uh, you know you know you know brokers stock brokers and so forth. that is very key because regulation should be divorced from acting so we have boards in zimbabwe that are both actors uh, and regulators so portras for instance is both a player and an actor mm-hmm. zinara for instance is both a, a player and a, and a regulator Buzz, the Broadcasting Authority of Zimbabwe, is both a player and a regulator. We want to divorce as a principle of, of corporate governance, a participation in the economy and regulating. You can't be a referee and a player. You are number two or you are number nine, uh, uh, number ten, Lionel Messi, but you are a referee at the same time. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the reforms which we are making in the regulatory infrastructure of this economy. Okay. Now, listeners, um, we've, we've been advised that we're going to move out. We're going to actually do our show up to nine o'clock tonight. So that's an hour and a half uh, because I think this conversation there's still some way to go um, so let's take uh, some questions but please feel free to get out on our whatsapp number 073-116-8045 or our various social media platforms facebook and twitter and we're live streaming on facebook zfm stereo page thank you um, a question from a listener are you going to arrest those who milked our nation of the billion dollars to book or are you going to look the other way that's Ab- abraham tanda and those who stole from the government through CIO, defense, and police departments, how are we going to get it back from those, those politicians? Again, Abraham from Makoni North, Tanda. Yeah, thank you, Abraham. I, I think that, I think that uh, the biggest uh, loss we have suffered as a country is the theft of our diamonds, diamond money. And, and international organizations, such as international NGOs, such as Global Witness, local activists such as uh, Farai Magu, have done fantastic job in actually tracing where that money is. So, so we propose that in an MDC Alliance government, we should set up a judicial commission of inquiry, a judicial commission of inquiry that will investigate where our diamond money uh, went. Even if we recover two billion dollars in, it will go a long way in addressing some of our of some of our of our of our challenges because but corruption is a huge issue i mean it's a huge yeah. issue. And i mean not not i mean zani perf itself has said that i mean the president Mnangagwa has said he's fighting against corruption and i think in your manifesto you're very clear about that too on the transparency uh, international corruption uh, uh, coefficient we rank in africa only worse than uh, nigeria uh, 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 Kenya and, and, and South Africa. That means this is a cancer that we've addressed to address. So we propose, for instance, stiffer uh, penalties for corruption. We propose, for instance, uh, uh, the setting up of specialized fraud courts that will fast track criminal trials uh, in Zimbabwe. We propose for any public official, whether you are a, 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 a director in the Ministry of Agriculture, or a minister of agriculture or the president of the country we propose annual asset declarations tell us how many goats you have tell us how many kids uh, you you have tell us how many wives you have <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> get the we idea also yeah. propose zimra to empower zimra to have the power to conduct lifestyle audits because there are some people in our country who live in these lavish mansions but no one can trace the tax audit. Where did you pay the, you know, the, you know, the tax audit? We propose strengthening the anti-corruption uh, commission, the Zimbabwe Republic uh, Police. So corruption has to be dealt with. But in my respectful opinion, the biggest way of dealing with the corruption is to make sure that there is availability. Because where there is shortage, corruption will arise. Just look at what is happening. We don't have uh, U.S. dollars in our market at the present moment. So we've turned honest men into criminals because everyone is going to Fort Street to buy 
a foreign currency. So we are making innocent people, corrupt people, but they're not corrupt people. You have to pay for school fees for your child. You have to pay for health for your sister who's going to South Africa. So so let's make let's create a functional economy so that the incentive corrupt for corruption disappears. And that should be the major, major, major focus. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, join us after the break. We're going to take a short break now. Join us after the break uh, and you'll, you'll join us with Tendai Biti, principal of MDC Alliance. Okay, welcome back to Business Unusual. I'm Andy Hodges. Uh, our guest tonight is Tendai Beatty. He's one of the key principals of the MDC Alliance. And tonight we're talking about the MDC Alliance manifesto that was released this morning. Um, but we're looking at it more from the economic and business perspective to see how the manifesto would affect Zimbabwe, um, the way it's set down. Now, um, Tendai, now one of the holy grails of the 100 billion economy is job creation and formalization of the economy now that's critical because um you know all of these things knit together do they not so how what is the mdc alliance supposed to be doing to create jobs because jobs of course people want to work they don't want to be vendors or they want they will need jobs they need to, whether it's entrepreneurship whether they get uh, uh, money for setting up their own business and so forth what does the mdc alliance say about that in terms of what you, you what you would propose to do? Excellent question. And first, let's stabilize the, the, the economy. Let's stabilize the economy. Let's run the economy well. Let's have the economic hygiene well. Number two, let's have foreign direct investment of at least 25% of GDP. That speaks for itself. Because if you have foreign direct investment, you have fresh money that can re- kickstart uh, the economy. Number three, construction. The reason why we are going to town about construction, infrastructure, is very key. One of the things you haven't asked me about is housing. Mm. We we are proposing massive housing housing program for Zimbabwe. One of the things you haven't asked me is about Dura, our our development and urbanization of rural areas, where we propose to have standard houses in rural areas. Now, when you build a house, you are developing your country. You are giving a roof over someone, but you're also creating a job. When you construct a road, Zimbabwe has got a road network of 88,000 uh, kilometers, but less than seven, t- sorry, 10% of that is paved. So when we attend to the roads that we propose in our document, it means we are creating a, a job uh, for someone. So what we are doing is not new. President Roosevelt yeah, no, did I mean, this, America has done this in 1929 yeah. during the Great I mean, Depression. So, so money during the infrastructure projects exactly. and you create so, a job bump in, in, in GDP. Words, in other words, yeah, in other that, words, that's not sustainable, surely, is it? It's not, that's not it's long-term basic, jobs. It's it? basic Keynesian economics. You construct your way out of a crisis. This is basic Keynesian economies from the great John Maynard uh, Keynes. Number three, number three. Uh, it's it's a, a public works a, a program. Public works program in any country are a major source of uh, employment creation. Number three, uh, entrepreneurship. Converting our vendors, our makorokosas, our, our cross border into real proper entrepreneurship, trained provision of SME financing and so forth. Is that how you're going to do it? Through SME financing? Yes, it's, it's there in our document. Yes. Number four, and very critical, formalizing the informal sector. The informal sector creates a lot of value. Look at the, the transport system in Zimbabwe. The public transport system is, is collapsed, but there are combis that are ferrying people every day to work. Those combis are not formalized. The informal sector is not formalized. So let's formalize uh, the informal sector. Okay. Number five, let's restart these industries. So, as I'm talking to you now, massive industries have shut down in Zimbabwe. Cisco Steel, for instance. The National Railways, at its peak, and we say this somewhere in our manifesto, at its peak, the National Railways of Zimbabwe was the biggest company in Zimbabwe, employing 15,000 uh, uh, people. So, the recapitalization of these companies is critical in creating, uh, in creating okay, but, jobs. But, and you're saying mining, that... The mining sector, right. for instance, is a major, is a major creator of employment. But, but we propose a changing of the mining model to one which we are calling in that document spatial mining development. And here we are proposing that traditional mining uh, end is high value but low impact. If you go to Rengo Mine, we, where I'm going for a rally on, on, on Sunday in Chiredz, Rengo Mine, the road from, from Rengo Mine to Chiredz is about 90 kilometers of desolate road, of decayed road. So when we mean special development, we mean creating 
backward linkages, forward linkages. Zimplads in Ngezi has done it. There are schools there. There are hospitals there. There are communities there. So the mind becomes organic. Okay. Yeah. But, but so, Tendai, so all Tendai, these things yeah. create jobs in the. Tendai, and all yes, these but, things have yeah. been tried and tested in other countries. Okay. But the premise here, the premise here, Tendai, of course, is that this is backed by private funding, correct? PPPs you talked about. I mean, all these things you're talking about is infrastructure development. I mean, when you talk about roads the, the and government, railways and so road. forth. Public works programs are, are, are you know. So where does yeah. so government again gets the money from? Andy, I've already told you, even no, now when things are difficult, yeah. Andy, we are collecting 300 million US dollars. That's okay. a lot of money, Andy. So you believe that the That's money is there to be able to do this infrastructure? It's a question of priorities. Prioritization. Yes, okay, priorities. Let, let's, let's take a question. The presentation from Mr. Tendai Beatty is pregnant with meaning. The manifesto sounds workable at face value. I want to believe, given the opportunity to put it into practice, we are likely to see a progressive Zimbabwe. The question to meet Mr. Beatty, however, is do we have the capacity to turn the economy in the positive within the time frame the alliance is putting across absolutely P- people 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 mustn't forget that we are not green ones you know andy you know andy that in 2008 things were terrible my first day at work at the minister of finance a director called Fungwakunaka said minister welcome but tomorrow is paid day I said oh how much are we supposed to to pay and he said to me hey, kunaka minister we are supposed to pay 30 million dollars. So I said to Mr. Knaka, how much do we have in the bank? We've got 4 million dollars. So I said, Mr. Knaka, where are we going to get the 26 million? Oh, we were waiting for you, sir. But we we turned it around. We collected 4 million dollars in January of 2009. We collected 15 million dollars in, 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 in February of 2009. We collected 25 million dollars in March of 2009. But guess what we collected in June, Andy? Mm. We collected 90 million US dollars. So, this is from what? This is just from the, the fiscal discipline. Yes, okay. trust. People had stopped paying taxes. But okay. because the, there were people that they could trust, people started paying uh, taxes. My last budget, my last budget, my first budget was a $700 million budget. My last budget was a $4.5 billion budget. Okay. All so, right. so this is very now, doable. Now, wh- one of your one of your uh, pledges in your manifesto is that you want to attain an average growth rate of ten percent. Now, that that seems quite high. I mean, if you look back in even historically, for example, I mean, uh, the World Bank is saying now that our 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 economic growth for this year will probably be around what two point eight percent. Government is saying seven and a half. But you're saying basically an average growth rate of ten percent. Yeah, but but read uh, read uh, read our macroeconomic framework. Read our macroeconomic framework. Uh, so, so, th- so this year the growth rate would actually be about two percent this year for the government, okay. even on our figures. Next year our growth rate will be under five percent, very modest. Okay. Very modest. Remember, it's average. But, but, look at 2020 now, because the calculation is very simple. This year we are stabilizing the economy. In March of next year, we have proposed the, a coordination program called the Zimbabwe Emergency Rescue Plan. We want fiscal control to get things right because the economy is hemorrhaging. But once we stabilize, once we restore trust, we estimate that by the by the end of the second year, huge construction projects are now in place. Bait Bridge uh, to, 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 to Victoria Falls, the road is being modernized. The, the, the airports we have spoken about. So it spikes, the GDP will spike. So... 10% growth rate in nominal terms is very achievable. Our average growth rate during the GNU, a very difficult period, nice. was actually 10%. But we're operating in a very difficult environment, a government of national unity, where we spend so much time squabbling. Nice. Our, our, our half, our, our, one half of our hand was tight. So I've absolutely no doubt in my mind, Andy Watches, mm. that... The MTC Alliance will deliver this program. I have absolute doubt in my mind. All right, okay. Well, let's just step a little back because there's a question here about uh, about the civil servants. Um, now, it's clear that there are areas in the civil servants that we are we are lacking in staff. For example, nurses, doctors, teachers, I think are three good examples. So, when you re- when you say you're realigning the, the civil service, okay, to get rid of ghost workers and so forth, that doesn't obviously mean that you're not going to prioritize areas where you need to ha- where you need to hire to make sure that, for example, education is critical, correct? And you even in your own manifesto, you talked about education, how about education is a bedrock for our growth of our economy. So, what what would you as an NBC Alliance do in terms of hiring those those areas where we do require staff in the civil servants? It doesn't seem to equate together with you having no, no, to no, rationalize it. How? No, no. 
rationalizing is rationalizing cost workers. It's okay. not rationalizing genuine civil servants. We have a skills shortage in the country. We have a, we have a, a, you know a shortage of physicians in, in the country. Mm. In places like uh, Matebele and Matebele North, there's one physician serving two hundred and fifty thousand uh, you know you know you know you know you know people. So restocking the quality of the civil service is key. And this is where this is where our diaspora is going to be very key. We have to give incentives and we say in that document for voluntary repatriation or for our diaspora because we've got ex- skilled labor if you were to take away all the doctors that are working in south africa right now their their public health system would shake if you were to take away all the doctors that are working in swaziland right now that are working in in in, in, in botswana right now if you were to take away zimbabwe nurses working in australia in places like liverpool sydney and all the nurses that are working in the united kingdom the health system would fill their absence so you're calling so, for diasporans with those skills to start coming home is this what you're three, manifesting three, three with things, yeah three things let's produce these people at our universities at our nursing colleges and so forth but if the diaspora want to yes would we'll welcome their their skills back but let's respect them as diaspora that's why what we have got a section in our chapter four on cit- on citizens rights mm. and protection we've got a section on the diaspora that we need to recognize that these guys are giving us a billion dollars in 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 remittances we have to respect them by giving them the right to to, to you know to, to vote okay all right yeah. well before we carry on with the next point in our in your holy grail the hundred billion dollar economy uh listeners feel free to what's up please on zero seven three one one six eight zero four five or our various social media platforms facebook and twitter and of course we are we are facebook living right now on zfm stereo's facebook page let's just take a question it, it's we'll get back to the the hundred billion economy just now but the question is hi there can you ask mr bitty how the manifesto turns to deal with regularization of mushrooming, mushrooming new settlements like Eastview and Hopi. I think this is about the, the yes, squatter yes, camps yes, and so forth that are coming up. Yes, what yes. does the alliance uh, yes. propose for that? An excellent question. So we have a very, we have a very exciting ex- a, a section on housing. So we propose that we should come up with a new national housing uh, policy. We propose that uh, we need major amendments to the Urban Councils Act to the Rural District Councils Act and to the Regional Town and Country Planning Act. So we propose that uh, we should make uh, we should make the provision house of housing easy, but that must be balanced by the provision of planned and safe uh, housing. So we propose number one to rationalize settlements that have emerged without planning, uh, rationalizing by integrating them into a local authority. So a good example is Epworth. A good example is, is Eastview. A good example is Caledonia. A good example is Wopley Farm in, 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 in um, Westgate there. These are settlements that have been, that are mushrooming, but they are not integrated into Greater Harare. So there's no sewer. There is no refuse collection. Mm. There is no... I, uh, so integration is going to be key. And town planners will be able to do this uh, very, so very th- easily. So, so there's no fears, for example, uh, that, that these settlements will be knocked down or, or no. residents will, no, be, no, no, will be forced to move no, under your No, but they have to plan. be rationalized. They have to be planned. Each house has to have a house number. And there has to be basic, decent amenities. They have to be basic, decent standards uh, to that particular to that particular house. Okay, all right. Let's we, take let's take a question. Ap- apologies, Tendai. Um, hi, Andy. Uh, BT and Chamisa are lawyers, and they know how to play around with words. They will mortgage Zimbabwe to the private sector. South Africa is crying over toll gates for those roads. Why are they not introducing the Zim dollar? Since we can trust them. From Albert in Harare. And of course, the second question, I think you got that, Tendai. How do they plan to pay the civil service well? Where's the money to come from to retract those skills back? I think it's back to this question of where's the money coming from? I think this is what it is. But the first issue is, is we, we, are you mortgaging Zimbabwe to the private sector? No. Because everything is about PPPs and no. so forth. No, no, is not there everything. Any, not hmm. everything. It's just the infrastructure in there. Okay. It's just the infrastructure. It will be... But you also talk about mining needs to be these PPPs. Chapter, yeah, yeah, you talk about yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and health needs PPPs. Mi- mining, mean, mining doesn't need PPPs. It needs private investors. Okay. Yeah. So, we have the, our document has got six chapters. The first chapter is on governance. There are no PPPs there when you deal with corruption. There are no PPPs there when you, when you implement a devolution. 
there are no peoples there when you say we want to respect our country's heritage by t respecting traditional healers. There's no money there. So good governance doesn't need money. Chapter 3, our chapter, our, our, our chapter 3, chapter 2 is with the economy. Chapter 3 is social services and delivery. So we're talking about health there. We're talking about uh, education there. We're talking about uh, uh, the obligation of the state to, to housing. We're talking about media reform and all these things don't cost money. It doesn't cost money to say in Zimbabwe, we've got one broadcasting house. Can anyone who wants to start a broadcasting house start? So this program is not predicated on money, but on smart, uh, on smart ideas. You don't, need, you don't need a lot of money to say people living with disabilities. You are going to have the government recognize in public place amenities for, for disabilities, lifts that are provided for disabilities. It's just leadership. And that's why our documents say, yes, we've got problems. Yes, the economy is bad. But the biggest deficit, the biggest question in Zimbabwe has not been money. It has been leadership. And that's what we seek to provide okay. in that document. All right. Now, now one of the, uh, I think, two, two, 213, devolution. I think you yes. mentioned this in your document. And, and, and I think it's something that a lot of people can't really get their heads around. Now, devolution, I suppose, implies that each separate region would have its own parliament, its own council and so forth. So maybe you could you could describe what is the MD, MDC Alliance's view on devolution. And you say you say that it doesn't cost money. But yeah, surely when you have these additional structures in place in, in the de devolved uh, areas, the, you, that will obviously have a cost going. And, and let me tell you something about devolution. It's our, it's our revolution. Devolution is not a political thing. It's a developmental issue. There is no country in the world that I know which is not devolved. Whether it's South Africa with its nine or so provinces, whether it's the United States of America with its fifty or so states, whether it's the 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 the, 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 the whether it's German, German is a, a federal state, whether it's the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom is devolved, Welsh, Scotland, mm. they're all devolved states. But even inside states in England, boroughs or local authorities as we call them, councils, they've got power. The power to determine their own immediate developmental needs, their own immediate social needs. So just to give you an example, just to give you an example, a minister sitting in Harare won't know what to do in Mutoko, whether to build a bridge in Nyamuziwe or in Nyadire. It requires people in that local community to determine that. That's why devolution is so important. And devolution is also important to resolve the national question. There are citizens in Zimbabwe, particularly from Matibele and who are affected by Gugura Wundi, who don't know what it means to be a Zimbabwean because they've been alienated, they've been reified. Devolution allows them national participation and national stakeholding. It, the way we have structured, the way devolution is structured in our constitution, in chapter 14, doesn't cost a lot of money because provincial councils the structure of devolution in our constitution is as follows. We've got two metropolitan provinces, mm. Arare and Bulawayo. In respect of those, all the elected councillors and MPs are members of the metropolitan council. So the government is not pumping out extra, but these people are already being paid as, 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 as MPs or as councillors. In respect of the other provinces now which do not have metropolitan council, councils, all the elected MPs from that province let's say it's Manikaland, are members of the provincial uh, council. A certain number of uh, councillors from a local from a local road district council are also members of the of the uh, uh, of the provincial council. The only extra cost is about 10 or so people that are allowed to be appointed that form part of the executive government of this. So yes, there's money, but that's the best way of spending our money. And in the long term, this is what will save Zimbabwe in the long term, this is what will develop Zimbabwe, devolution. That's why it's one of our key cornerstones of our campaign in this election. Okay, you, so you say devolution, but of course with the central government control in terms of the funding and management of the economy? Or are you saying yes, that the, because, that the because, actual devolved state will be able to the, manage their the, own budgets, yes, manage their own expenses, yes, and so forth? The constitution already. So this is already provided in the constitution. It's not, so, so on devolution, we are largely complying with the existing constitution. Okay. I say largely because there's one area of difference. The current devolution module in the in our constitution says, when these councillors that I was talking about in, in the MP seats, they choose and elect their own chairperson or provincial governor. 
we on the other hand are saying that the public members of the public mm. should actually choose their provincial governor just like we are saying we want to restore as mdc alliance we want to restore the institution of executive mayors that are directly elected by the people that's the difference yeah, but by and large our devolution model is following what is already in the constitution and you are speaking about the resources uh, section 300 already says that there is to be equitable distribution of resources equitable allocation in the budget to all provinces so so that obligation is already is already there we're not creating anything new okay we have a question here from double thank you double um hi andy what is the mdc alliance stance on cryptocurrencies yes excellent question excellent question cryptocurrencies you need to recognize what they are cryptocurrencies are born out of crypto technology and crypto technology is an extension of what is known as blockchain technology so if you look at our chapter on the ICTs, we say that the future of this, we want to move the country into the fourth revolution. The fourth revolution being the ICT uh, revolution. And here we celebrate the following things, Andy. We celebrate, number one, the access to broadband uh, facilities, I, 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 Wi-Fi. ICT. Yeah. So we say that Wi-Fi is a human right. Number two, the access to cloud computing. Because preserving your documents has become mm-hmm. so key. So that's another uh, another right. Number three is blockchain technology. Number four is artificial intelligence. The world is going to be run by robotics, uh, r- robots. So artificial intelligence is going to be key. Number four is 3D printing. 3D printing is changing uh, the world. People are, are printing st- stories that are 27 uh, story high. So 3D printing is, is, is critical. Number five is the Internet of Things. Number six is, is nano uh, uh, you know, technology. technology. Number seven is convergence. All technologies are now converging. Look at what you can do with your smartphone. You are streaming uh, this program right now from a smartphone. So, so, we, so because we believe in blockchain technology, we accept cryptocurrencies. And if you look at our section on currency reform, we make it very clear that we are going to accept as legal tender in Zimbabwe cryptocurrencies. Okay, so cryptocurrencies under the MDC Alliance's manifesto will be something that's accepted here. Now, there is something in your manifesto which is interesting. You seem to link social decay and the economy. I mean, you, you say in your manifesto, Zimbabwe's economic collapse has triggered a rise in social decay at various levels. The core unit around society has built the family, is experiencing huge strains as family members migrate away from Zimbabwe in order to fend for their families. Challenges at the family level reflected by high number of cases of divorce, domestic violence, and peace orders that have been granted by the courts. So you, are you saying that if the economy is healthy, this, this sort of social uh, collapse uh, it, it would, would actually get better? Is, is this still, it this is the it, comment? It takes more than the economy. It takes more than the economy. And the social fo- fabric of our country is, is collapsed. That's why we talk of uh, restoring the social contract. How do we restore the social contract? We bring everyone together under an, a common national vision. We, we, and we, section 2 of our, of our chapter 2 on governance speaks about nation building. We have never built a society in which everyone, black, white, colored, if I might say that, feels that he or she belongs. Number three, let's deal with the program of national healing. As Zimbabweans, we hate each other so much. We are so intolerant. Number four, transitional justice. We've done terrible things to each other in the past, Andy, which we have not talked about. Gugura Hundi, for instance, the land reform program, for instance, the political violence around 2008. I myself was arrested and tortured in 2008 for merely announcing uh, election results. So we are saying let's rebuild Zimbabwe. So that in a functional economy uh, uh, is important. We speak about prosperity, Andy. By prosperity, if you look at our vision in that document, we are saying we want to create a a, a just, a a transformative democratic development of state in which people are free to pursue opportunities and happiness. We consider happiness so key because we have suffered for 38 years and enough is enough. Okay, now, now Zandi have talked about setting a, a middle income economy by the word 2030, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it appears as, as well as if your, your manifesto is clearly going towards that kind of state of affairs in terms of uh, raising of incomes and so forth, uh, so the standard of living raising, uh, adv- access to goods and services and so on and so forth. So what is the fundamental difference between Zandi saying that we want to be a middle income economy by 2030 and the MDC's 
election manifesto, MDC Alliance Man election manifesto, which effectively is trying to create the same sort of environment for, for our citizens, correct? And that can be a vision. And by the way, the World Bank and the African Development Bank actually classify us as a middle income. That's why we've not been eligible for YPIC, the highly indebted poor country, because we're not low income. And when you look at our section on debt, SADSA, the smart areas and debt development strategy, one of the things that we say is that we want to reconfigure the economy to confirm our low income uh, level. Saying we want to be middle income can, cannot be a vision. But saying you want to construct a modern state that functions with all the things I was talking about, that's a vision. So that's a point of departure. ZANU is operating on slogans, uh, uh, open for business, middle income, but there's no substance. Our document is about substance. Okay, all right. Uh, we'll take a, a last question. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. And <laughs> again, we, this is an hour and a half show instead of an hour. Now, one of the issues in your manifesto was regaining lost international markets, including the EU, yes. uh, leveraging and specializing yes. in eight areas, horticulture, yes. livestock, legumes, grains, yes. etc. Yes. So, I mean, the question is, is that you want to regain markets. In your manifesto, and unfortunately, you haven't got a lot of time, but in your manifesto, is this manifesto good for business? And how is it yes, good for it business? Is. Yes, yes, and How is it good for business? It's not good for business. It's excellent for business. It's excellent for workers. It's excellent for women. It's excellent for children. For business, we are, we are, we are talking about foreign direct investment. We are low, lowering taxes. Uh, for the worker, we are protecting rights. We are giving more income. We are lower, lowering payee levels of, of payee. And this manifesto is a revolution. And any Zimbabwe who reads it, can see our sincerity, can see our originality, can see our disruptiveness. But but more importantly, Andy, we have done this before. We are tried and tested. We have done this before. No one in Zimbabwe forgets that his life or her life was actually better during the government of National Union. Okay. And of course, when we're gaining lost international... I mean, what, one thing that comes through in, in sense of Zimbabwe is that, as we, as we talked about, well, a well, nation well, of just importers... On, just on that one, yes. we used to, to supply... 90,000 metric tons of beef to the European Union. We have lost that. We need to regain that quota. We need to regain that uh, international uh, market. Right. We used to sell uh, ch computer chips from WRIS. There was a company called WRIS in Bulawayo, Supersonic in Bulawayo. You, you remember I this. remember them. Yes, you're, you're old man. <laughs> <laughs> Not that Sorry. old, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> we, we used to manufacture in, in, in 1980. We were the third most developed manufacturing country in the in the in, in Africa. So so we can do this. We can restore Zimbabwe back to its glory days. Okay, I think I think uh, I think on that note, uh, we unfortunately have to wind this up. Uh, we've only touched the surface, I think, of some Absolutely. of the some of the issues in the Ma MDC Alliance manifesto. Absolutely. And of course, we will be looking in previous shows at other parties' manifestos and MPF manifesto as well, and having the same debate. So okay. don't worry, listeners. At the end of the day, I think it's up to the parties for them to come and explain the manifestos from a business and economic viewpoint, mm -hmm. and it's for you to, for you to listen. Um, so. It's, it's my pleasure to thank uh, Mr. Tendai BT and the principals of the MDC Alliance. Tendai, thank you so much for coming in. It's been a, it's been a great discussion, and I thank appreciate you, that. I really enjoyed it myself. Thank you. And as usual, we end on our quote. Voting is how we participate in a civic society, be it for president, be it for municipal election. It's the way we teach our children how to be citizens and the importance of their voice. Every time we go into the voting booth, we are choosing the moral and spiritual direction of our nation. That is a privilege and a responsibility that should not be abdicated. Something to think about. Good night, and you will be safe. <laughs>